Hello and welcome to our Minds and Money 5 at 5 show, which this week is sponsored by Endeavour Mining, Orcano Resources and Oceana Gold, and is brought to you in association with Resource Global Network. For those of you attending 5 at 5 for the first time, the aim of 5 at 5, 5 guests at 5pm, is to maintain engagement between investors and miners through a lively, interactive format during the current situation. A few admin announcements before we start. To make it this as interactive as possible, please have your videos switched on. To ask a question, you have a couple of options. You can either submit them in the chat function, which is at the bottom of your screen, or you can also wave your hands via the invite participants function. I will unmute you and you can ask your question live. We'll also be having a couple of polling questions throughout the five of five where you can vote. Um, in towards the end of the week, we encourage you to bring along a glass of wine or beer to relax, sit back and enjoy. <laughs> this week's show features two established gold producers projects, Endeavour Mining, where we're joined by Martino De Vizio, Vice President Strategy and Investor Relations, uh, Oceana Gold, where we're joined by Sam Pazuki, VP Corporate Development and Investor Relations, an exciting silver exploration company, Orkana Resources, where we are joined by Kevin Drover, their CEO, and then on the investor analyst side, we're joined by John Kumbai, senior analyst with Berenberg, an analyst with 20 years experience, and Angelos Damascos, chief executive officer of sector investment, uh, of sector investment managers. Welcome to you all. Um, first of all, I'd just like to kind of kick off with a, with a segment where I just want to just take a look at back at some of the key mining news stories of the last few weeks that have caught our two investor analyst guests. Uh, turning to Angelos first, can you perhaps pick out one mining news story over the last few weeks that has caught your eye? Well, uh, I thought about your question, Andrew, and I thought it's an amusing uh, development in the story, uh, which uh, has occurred at the gold mining company called Petro Pavlovsk. For those who don't know, it is a, one of the largest uh, gold producers in Russia. And uh, apparently today was announced that the Russian prosecutors have launched a criminal investigation into its uh, interim chief executive. And uh, it's useful to remind people that uh, there has been a, some kind of an internal control uh, struggle at the company uh, by the different uh, significant minority shareholders who have been trying to gain control of the board and the management of the company. And the, the story is basically a, a classic one in uh, less politically stable territories like Russia. And I have seen it many times in my career before. And it just reminds me of the reason why we avoid those politically stable places in our investments. Uh, uh, investing in resources, is inherently risky and cyclical. Uh, we are all price takers on the commodity. So we believe that uh, it doesn't make sense to add uh, a layer of risk uh, by political developments where certain factions or governmental or non-governmental could expropriate your assets directly or indirectly. So we try to stick to politically stable uh, pol uh, territories and, and uh, focus on the resource uh, risk and the risk of mining. Mm -hmm. and turning to yourself, Jonathan, what sort of uh, stories particularly caught your eye over the last couple of weeks? It's, it's not really a single story. It's, it's a series of stories. And, and that, that would be, um, I guess, the strike at uh, Candelaria, the Lundin asset. Um, the potential strike at Escondida, the strike at Resolute Siama mine in, in, in Mali, and uh, the, the unrest around Antipakai, the Glencore asset in Peru. And I think um, something that's going to be an increasing issue for both for operators and investors over the next six months to a year is the second order issues of, of the pandemic in terms of industrial unrest, civil unrest, and, and, and eventually higher taxes and, and, and royalties being inflicted on people. And I, I think you know, one, of, one of the big issues for the industry is how does, uh, how does it navigate that and how does it uh, manage uh, societies which are perhaps in, in, in more of a state of stress and flux than they have been for a number of years. I mean, certainly if you look at the, um, the, the environment post the global financial crisis where we saw unrest across the, the Middle East, the, 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 the Arab Spring and so forth, um, that, type of, uh, that type of unrest is highly likely after something as disruptive as this as well. And I think you know, it, it raises questions, uh, raises questions across the board for the industry. Mm -hmm. Then I guess sort of bring in, I think I think bring in um, Sam into the conversation. I mean, how, how does like a company like Oceana Gold sort of like manage that sort of risk? 
Yeah, no, it's a great question, Andrew. I mean, we, um, we've had a, a very challenging year. Uh, mining is, is already a, uh, an industry that has a fair degree of risk, uh, whether it's operational, financial, or social, as, as some of the members here have discussed. Uh, the extra layer of nuance, obviously, is, is the uh, global pandemic and, uh, and trying to manage the, the risk associated with that uh, to, to ensure that you've safeguarded your, your workforce from, uh, from the virus. And I, I mentioned uh, just a few minutes ago before we started that, you know, we, we're operating in New Zealand where uh, they, the, the country took some fairly draconian measures to, um, to lock down the country and eradicate COVID. So they, they've had to go through it twice now, um, but now they're packing stadiums. 50,000 people are going to watch rugby. So it's, it's business as usual there. Um, and so life is, is fairly normal. Uh, in the United States, we operate in South Carolina. And uh, what we've seen since July 4th, since the Independence Day weekend, is uh, basically a, a, a state a population that's tired of being in, in lockdown. And so they're, they're behaving as if there is no global pandemic. Uh, and that's the extra layer that we need to manage from a risk perspective. Um, so we, we, try, we try to manage as well as we can, but it's clearly something that's very different this year uh, than other years for us to continue to manage and make sure that we keep everyone safe, uh, but we're also delivering our commitments to shareholders. And bringing in Martina from Endeavour into the conversation how do you go and manage that sort of particular area of risk with regards to strikes well it's been it's uh jonathan made an interesting point and, and named a few companies that have had strikes uh probably goes back to some of the esg esg themes we've been talking about over the last few years uh for us we haven't had a strike in any one of our minds over the last three years uh so it goes back to having good relations with the communities uh with the employees and with the government uh, so for us, having a strong presence in West Africa means that we're able to uh, employ locals, but also ensure that they, could, they get promoted to manager status and eventually GMs. 40% uh, of our uh, mines in West Africa today have a West African GM. Uh, so uh, preventing strikes means that you need to be working in partnership with your employees and communities, uh, and that's how we've been able to mitigate this risk. And then there's just finally turning to yourself, Kevin. How do you sort of like manage your relations with community groups and also First Nations to avoid uh, the disaster strikes? Well, you know, uh, where we are in Colorado, there, there's really, you know, not, not a First Nations uh, group in, in that particular area. Um, uh, we do enjoy some very, very good uh, relations with the local community in general, with the NGOs that are uh, in that area you know the state and federal legislatures and whatnot and you know we've got all of these groups to the site and uh you know currently I, I think as long as we do what we're supposed to do and do it well we'll, we'll be just fine uh relative to to the covid situation i'll just touch on that a little bit uh you know we've been very fortunate down there uh most of our activity is of course in colorado and uray county uh we've not within the company had any issues with that we do see some issues uh, mainly in the delivery of the, some of the products where some of the factories are not working at full speed and so on. Uh, so that can be, uh, you know, it's a risk that we got as we, we try and, and uh, get ourselves into production there. But uh, generally speaking, we've been fortunate that uh, it's not been a big, uh, big issue in the area that we're operating. But we do take all the necessary procedures and, uh, you know, do the, the regular things to try and manage uh, that situation. And hopefully, uh, you know, we'll get through this. Okay, thank you very much for that, Kevin. Um, so let's move on to our first mining update of the show. Martino, the video who uh, we uh, heard from earlier, is Vice President of Strategy and Investor Relations at Endeavour Mining, a position he assumed in late 2015. PSX listed Endeavour Mining is a top 15 global gold producer and is the largest producer in West Africa, following its acquisition of Tamafo in July of this year. And Endeavour, uh, Endeavour Martino has established a strong reputation for great investor relations, which was recognized earlier this week with five nominations for the Canada IR Magazine Awards and winning the Best in Sector Award for a mid-cap in the material space. Over to you, Martino. Thank you, Andrew. 
uh, and, and thanks as well to all those that have voted earlier uh, earlier this week in the past few months. Um, so for those of you that uh, don't know Endeavor, uh, Endeavor is now the largest West African gold producer with two mines in Ivory Coast, four in Burkina Faso, and a project in each, uh, each three countries present on the screen. Overall, we're a top 15 global gold producer, producing about a million ounces at less than $900 per ounce. A few quick stats on the regions, as we believe that West Africa is a hot mining region and a good place to be. Uh, we've put a few stats there on the right-hand side of the page. Uh, it's become, over time, the, la the uh, fourth largest gold-producing region globally. Uh, so today attracts, uh, in terms of exploration budget, has become the third largest global exploration budget, uh, and over the last decade ranks first in terms of discoveries with over 80 million ounces discovered. So we are now the largest gold producer in Ivory Coast and Burkina Faso, uh, which hosts more than half of the greenstone belt in, in the region. Uh, so we believe that we are very well positioned uh, to grasp opportunities in, in the region. Very interesting times for Endeavor. Uh, we've invested over a billion dollars into the last four years to build our business. In turn, this has uh, given us the Hunde mine, which was built in 2018. Uh, and right afterwards, the uh, the ET mine. Uh, so this is a great time for for investors, as uh, our portfolio is of high quality today, generating good cash flows. We're deleveraging ourselves very quick. Expect to be fully delivered by year end or beginning of next year, depending on gold price, which would be a, a big catalyst for us, as this is the um, criteria we set for ourselves in order to initiate our first dividend. Uh, so expect to become dividend payer in the upcoming quarters. Um, thank you very much for that, Martino. Um, just a couple of questions from my end. Is can you give us an update on an update on the restart and timescales for your Hongu mine? Yes. So uh, we've announced a few uh, few weeks ago that uh, we restarted the Bungu mine. Uh, in fact, this is an important milestone for us because it marks uh, really the completion of the semaphore integration process, which began. Uh, frankly, the day we published the, uh, the press release back in uh, early March. Uh, so by July 1st, we had the blueprint ready to go. Uh, and it's been interesting to see that uh, over the last four years, by building our flagship assets and solidifying our position in West Africa, we've been able to build a strong West African team. We have, a, we have our operating office in Abidjan, which means that all our mines in West Africa can leverage the expertise based in country. Uh, so we're not trying to manage mines uh, in West Africa based out of you know, Perth, Vancouver, or you know, far away. Uh, so the mines uh, that we brought in from the Semafo side have been able to leverage this expertise now, uh, and it's been going very well. Uh, you would have seen in that same press release that we announced uh, roughly 40 million of annual savings uh, from, from synergies, uh, which are expected to be extracted over the coming, in fact, in the fourth quarter and into next year. Uh, this represents over... 15% uh, of some of those cost base. So uh, pretty important synergies being seen, uh, mostly on the procurement side. Uh, so being a larger uh, group in, in the region has allowed us to renegotiate long-term contracts. And it's also brought uh, you know, strength in relation with the governments. Being the largest producer in both countries means that you're more important to them and therefore uh, you have more support, whether it be on security, uh, VAT negotiation, getting uh, new permits, et cetera, et cetera. So a uh, real benefit for us to be strategically positioned as uh, the largest producer in West Africa. Okay. Um, we have a question in from the audience from Jacob Ambrose Wilson of Resource Global Network. What procedures has Endeavour put in place in response to security issues in the West Africa region? I mean, going back to the question of size, uh, size also enables you to have a strong security platform. Uh, unlike a, you know, a small junior producer or, or exploration, uh, for, you know, for us, we're able to have security structured as a business unit. Uh, so our head of security came from the French Army, uh, was employed four years ago when, when the new management joined Endeavor. Uh, and you know, we've established ourselves uh, from a security standpoint as uh, a specific unit. So it's not your GM who typically is an engineer or a geologist, uh, to be able to manage security. Uh, so this allows us to have a strong platform with uh, good intel with uh, the uh, local army, but also allows us to have airstrips on each site. 
so we finished to build the airstrip at Bungu back in August. Uh, we have uh, our own aircrafts, which bring uh, employees from Abidjan, capital of Ivory Coast, to any one of our mines within three hours. So this has the benefit of, from security standpoint, but also uh, strong operating efficiencies, given that we're able to move the expertise very quick across different mines. Our CEO was in West Africa last week, uh, and it's a strong advantage to be able to visit four mines in the span of five days. Okay. There was an FT online mining conference last week where every miner was keen to stress their ESG credentials. Can you kind of summarize what Endeavor's ESG approach and philosophy is? Yes, I mean, uh, our ESG philosophy approach you know, won't be too different than, than those of our peers. I think as an industry, we've all been trying to do the right things from an ESG perspective. Uh, you know, for us, having a strong ESG function means hiring as many locals as possible, which in turn means that you, know, you have less pressure on, on, on having strikes. It means paying taxes in country. It means you know, a number of things which ultimately are you know, good business sense things to do. Uh, what's changed over the last, let's say, 18 months is the stronger focus on increasing transparency and disclosure. Uh, the difficulty that we've seen on the ESG side is um, the explosion of rating agencies. Uh, so all of a sudden, uh, rather than just you know, needing to uh, report along you know, the lines of GRI or a number of other things, you now need to have a number of independent uh, rating agencies doing box ticking exercises and uh, if they can't find the information you get a bad score. Uh, so it's been monopolizing a lot of time to try to lead us with all these rating agencies to make sure that uh, the efforts that we're doing are properly getting reflected into scores. Uh, I believe it's unfair for uh, investors to make decisions on ESG sourcing these third parties uh, where they, have, they don't have enough staff and resources to properly do an assessment. Yeah, I think I've seen, certainly I've heard a lot of very, very mixed sort of feedback when I talk to other uh, users about their sort of feelings about the rating uh, agencies that are sort of like springing up. I'm not too sure whether um, Sam, you had anything to, uh, to, like, to like add about the rating agencies? Yeah, no, I uh, agree with everything Martino said there. I mean, I think the industry is doing a very good job. Um, and there's been, with with ESG becoming more popular, I mean, it's become a buzzword of the last couple of years. And uh, with it are the increase in the number of rating agencies that we've seen. Uh, so there are some well-established ones that have been around for a number of years, which we've been engaging with, such as the MSCI and, and Sustainalytics. Uh, but we are seeing others um, either branch out from what they currently do. Um, so proxy advisors that are branching into um, ESG rating agencies. Uh, we are engaging with them. And as Martino said, I mean, we, we've, we do find it challenging to, to sort of handhold, uh, make sure that they've got the right information they need to make the proper assessments. I think, um, you know, investors are growing a little bit uh, confused with which, uh, which rating agencies they should be looking at. Um, but I also think they're struggling with how do you couple a ESG performance with financial performance? Uh, because at the end of the day, it still uh, depends on how you perform financially, which is your benchmark. Uh, but in, with time, we do see, and I do believe that uh, investors will, will sort of come up with some form of methodology where you can loop in uh, or tie in ESG metrics to the, the performance of a business over the short term and long term. Uh, so that, I think, is the part that's missing. Um, the rating agencies, um, again, as Martino said, are just doing uh, box ticking exercises. Um, so once you can marry the two between financial performance and ESG performance, I think then you've got yourself a, a pretty uh, robust uh, methodology to, to make the proper valuations that you need to make. And then, Andrew, just, just to add on top of that, you know, it, it, this box ticking exercise is missing uh, you know, people to analyze the data points. So for example, I've seen some companies get full points because they have a solar, uh, you know, solar energy. However, if someone were to go actually analyze the data, you know, I take us, for example, all our minds are connected to the grid, uh, which means that uh, we need to look at where the power from the grid is being sourced. 70% of ours is renewable energy. 
So we don't need to have uh, solar plants to, you know, to tick boxes. Uh, so, you know, some of the second layer uh, analysis uh, still needs to be done. Um, I just want to bring in uh, other kind of guests into this, uh, in, in, into uh, asking some uh, questions as well. Jonathan, Nuremberg Cover Endeavour, what are your thoughts on Endeavour and do you have a question for Martino? Well, look, we're, we're very positive on it and feel that Endeavour, particularly post the merger with Semifo, has uh, grown in to replace uh, the, the sort of gap in the market that was left by Rangel post the merger with Barrick a couple of years ago. It's a, it's a grown up company with a diversified asset base um, across West Africa with, with some great growth potential in there as well. And I think, um, you know, particularly the big catalyst for us over the next few months will be hopefully the announcement of a dividend from, uh, from 2021 and, and, and to see them begin to to, to, to start uh, distribute cash as the uh, as the balance sheet is strengthened, and, and secondly, we'd expect some more um, some more news over the short term about the Fetacro project, um, and, and we'd really like ask, to ask uh, Martino, you know, what sort of scale of project should we be thinking of there, and could it displace Kalana in your project uh, pipeline? Kalana being an asset they acquired some years ago in in Mali. As you would have seen with our presentations and enthusiasm on on the, on Fetacro, uh, the team is very excited. Uh, it's uh, you know go, going from first discovery to bringing it to two and a half million ounces in, in less than two years is a strong achievement. Uh, that made in resource, uh, most of it you know, over ninety percent is indicated material, uh, which means they can quickly get converted to reserves. Uh, so right now we're working on updating the PA, uh, expect to be published later this year. Uh, in terms of size, we believe that Fetacro has all the right characteristics to be an Endeavor type asset, uh, which right now we, you know, we've set for ourselves and it needs to be at least 200,000 ounces per year uh, in 10 years mine life. So at least 2 million ounces of reserves uh, with costs that are below 900 ASEC. Uh, so Fetacro with two and a half million ounces just in one deposit, uh, over a dozen other targets identified uh, near this one, uh, it sits in a good spot within the pecking order of our projects. Uh, comparing it to uh, Kalana, uh, Fetacro has uh, significant advantages. Uh, the first one is that it's located 20 kilometers away from infrastructure, so power line and, and roads. Uh, not much relocation to be done. Uh, recovery rates over 95%. Uh, so this is the most, you know, plain vanilla type uh, operation, uh, low risk that, that you can find in, in West Africa, uh, located in a country where we've built two mines uh, over the last decade. Uh, so we need to finish the studies to see how it compares to Fetacro, uh, for, to see how Fetacro compares to Kalana uh, and see what the pecking order there is. Uh, the beauty in our business plan is that uh, this year and next year are solely focused on generating cash flow, deleveraging ourselves, and initiating a dividend, as you've mentioned. Uh, within that time frame, we want to build optionality in the portfolio. So Kalana and Fetacro, we still have the luxury of having roughly a year to work on exploration and, and studies to get to a point whereby Q4 next year uh, will be well positioned to, uh, to decide which project we, we want to push forward. Uh, so great to have this optionality within our portfolio of Fetacro, Kalana, Nabanga, and Bantu uh, as, as projects in, in the pipeline. Okay. Thank you for that. And Angelus, what are your thoughts on Endeavour? And do you have a question for Martino? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, Endeavour obviously is the largest uh, gold miner in West Africa, a diversified company with many operating activities, uh, very seasoned and experienced uh, operator as well as explorer. Now, the, the acquisition of Semafo was consummated in the aftermath of the dreadful 2019, uh, you know, attack um, and uh, the the subsequent suffering uh, of, of uh, operations there. Um, and we have since seen uh, a political coup in Mali and some uh, regional instability. And, and I suspect that with the impact of COVID and the, the, the impact on the local population, we may have further instability. Do you have uh, a view on the situation? Are you feeling uh, comfortable with your operations there? Do you take any additional safeguards? And what is the, the corporate uh, stance generally? 
Th thank you for the question. Um, goes back to the question of scale and size, and both Endeavor and Semaphore felt that the combined entity would be better placed to manage risks uh, in uh, in West Africa. Uh, so for us, having the uh, uh, the right scale in country means that we were able to build airstrips on site. Uh, so the airstrip at Bungu was mentioned was was built in uh, in August, uh, which allows us to uh, fly people now all the staff you know from uh, the capital to to the mine site, uh, whereas uh, some of four were, were using that road. It also means that the government has pledged more support uh, for the region. Uh, so this is great in terms of securing the road, but more so uh, they are now planning uh, to upgrade the road as part of the infrastructure plans, which will bring economic development to the area. Uh, Bungu, uh, for those that, that may uh, may not know, is an area that is uh, very rural. Uh, so to be able to increase security in this area, we need to build uh, the local economy uh, and, and have more government support on, on the security side. So all those are, uh, are underway. Um, looking more generally at, at West Africa, uh, what's been interesting is that West Africa uh, at least the French-speaking West African countries in which we operate, uh, operate as an economic union. Uh, so they have the same central bank, same currency that's fed to the euro, uh, and a common army as well, which has, uh, which is starting to see some some strong benefits. Uh, the issues that were uh, that we were seeing in in, um, uh, in northern Mali and uh, uh, northern Burkina Faso are now being addressed. Uh, common uh, by, by the common army, so by the CL5 army, where the five West African countries are now treating this as a common issue and not just a Burkina issue. Uh, based on the elections that were had over the last decade, uh, and specifically in Burkina Faso uh, four years ago, uh, the new president in place has had uh, good help from uh, Western countries and specifically from France. Uh, so we're seeing, you know, good good things evolve on on each side, uh, which leaves us very confident for uh, the future of West Africa. Within some of this turbulence, we believe that there's, you know, good opportunities as well. Uh, so within a few years' time, we believe that West Africa will be very attractive, more so than it is today. Uh, and within that time frame, we would have consolidated our position with now being the leading uh, producer in the area uh, and would have replaced Rangold as the go-to name for West Africa. Thank you very much for that. Um, I think in the interest of time, we probably need to move on to our next presentation. It's on silver. Uh, Elaine, perhaps you could bring up our, our polling question up onto the screen, which is, of course, going to be about silver. And the question is quite straightforward. Where do you think the price of silver will be by the end of this year? Um, you've got a choice of five answers there, so voting is now open. Whilst you are voting, let me please introduce Kevin Drover, who's President and CEO of Orkana Resources. Kevin has more than 40 years of both domestic and international experience in operations, project development, management and process re-engineering with both developing and producing companies. Orkana Corporation is a Vancouver-based company whose shares are listed for trading on the TSX Venture Exchange. Um, Lane, perhaps we can close the poll and have the polling results up. We can just see as to how you've uh, voted there. Um, and then perhaps uh, over to you, kind of Kevin, with an opening question. A lot of the investors listening in onto this show probably own gold stocks, but maybe not so much silver stock. Why should they consider silver and why should they consider Orkana resources? Well, I think silver is uh, just in the early stages of a, of a bull market. Uh, you know, it's had a, a, quite an excellent run. It's been depressed for quite a period of time. And given the, uh, you know, the situation in the world where we're trying to, to a large degree, trying to achieve the Paris uh, Accord uh, uh, estimates and whatnot, uh, there was a report out of the Netherlands several months back uh, that talked to the very fact of, uh, you know, mining and its impact on achieving these, uh, these limits and whatnot. And we're going to need a lot more of everything, including silver on a go forward basis to, uh, to to be able to get that technology that's going to be needed to uh, to achieve these environmental standards and whatnot. So from where I said, I certainly see uh, the price of silver, uh, uh, you know, probably stabilizing here for a while. 
but I think uh, we'll see its march upwards, uh, you know, where it goes. Uh, I'm not a great believer in these, uh, you know, $100 uh, uh, per ounce. It might be at some point in time, but I think it's going to be higher than $25 an ounce on, you know, go forward basis, certainly going into uh, 2021. So, uh, you know, we at Orcana, we're believers in the price of silver, obviously, or we wouldn't be in the silver business. So yeah, that that's our uh, that's our take on it. I I, I think it's um, uh, you know silver is stabilized uh, in the in this mid twenties range uh, for the time being. We may see some volatility, especially with the U.S. election and whatnot. But uh, I think generally uh, we're uh, we're we're looking at a pretty good future over the next several years for certain with the silver price. Okay, and then um, do you have any specific um, updates you'd like to share with the audience about? Oh, Anna? Yes, indeed. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I'm not going to put up any uh, any slides. I'll just talk, talk to it a little bit. It's a brief, uh, just a brief overview. A lot of people uh, already know about Orcana. We've been around for a while. Um, we have uh, two uh, uh, primary projects, both in the United States in and in a relatively stable jurisdiction. Uh, the, the first one we have, and the one closest to production, is the Revenue Virginia's mine in Colorado, and we're, uh, we're in the process of getting that into production, and I'll come back to that. The second one we have is, uh, is in Texas. It's the Shafter mine. Uh, it was in production previously in 2013. It's at a PEA level. It needs some additional infill drilling and it needs a feasibility study. So it's our second in line. It's fully permitted for immediate production and it's got a 1500 ton a day milling processing facility on site. We still need to do that bit of technical work on it. Our focus right now is on getting the Revenue of Virginia's mine into production. That's located just outside of Ure, Colorado. Uh, which is about a seven hour drive southwest of, uh, of Denver. Uh, it's it's a, a, a well-known old mining jurisdiction, been many mines there over the years. The Revenue Virginia's mine is fully permitted. It has a processing facility in place. It has a feasibility study complete. Uh, and we have currently about 70 people, seven zero, uh, working at the site out of a maximum workforce when we're in full production of about 140. We have a full management team in place down there. Um, it's precious metals, primarily uh, silver and gold, but the, uh, the majority of the metals coming out of this operation is going to be uh, uh, silver with a gold kicker and some base metals. We're gonna uh, deliver a, uh, two products, basically lead and zinc. Gold and silver will be with the lead concentrate and, and so on. Um, as I said, the feasibility study is complete. It was done by SRK. Uh, and over the last year, uh, nine months or so, I guess, we've been um, trying to get our debt facility in place to, uh, to get that final piece of uh, funding to take us to full, produ full production. And this morning, we were able to announce that we had that piece in place. We have a $28 million uh, US dollar um, credit facility with uh, McCurrier. Uh, that's uh, now been uh, approved by the credit committee and we're just in the final stages of uh, definitive documentation. So we're anticipating closing that uh, and having funding in place for probably December 1st. Uh, meanwhile, uh, we, we have considerable funds in the bank right now. We're about $14 million US. So with the two, the 28 and the 14 we have in the bank, we're fully funded now uh, to go to production. Uh, we'll need about a 30 mil, additional $38 uh, million dollars U.S. to get into production. So we need, uh, you know, we've, we've got sufficient money to cover uh, some contingencies and things like that. We, we may come back to the market for a little bit more just to shore us up, but it won't be very much of, a, of, a, of an issue. So we're looking at uh, being a producer um, six months uh, from... Uh, from uh, the time we pulled the trigger on this. We're working towards uh, that right now. Uh, and we've already done a lot of work. We're doing underground pre-production infrastructure development. Uh, that's uh, being done. We're doing surface works uh, that we need to do uh, that are seasonally dependent. We should have all of that done and out of the way. So we're looking at being in production in the second quarter of 2021. So we're that close to production. Uh, and uh, we're hoping to be uh, uh, cash flow positive, certainly by the end of the first half 
of 2021. And, and, there, and there was a question that was sent in by the audience. What is the average mine life of your mines? We're at seven years right now. Uh, yeah. But this is a narrow vein system. Uh, all of our reserves right now are on 14, 4,000 feet of an 18,000 foot vein package that we own. Uh, that's just one vein. We own nine of these veins. We have access to them all. The underground access, we have a, uh, an 8,000 foot underground uh, tunnel that access these ore bodies and it cuts all of these veins. Uh, so we have a tremendous upside to this, uh, to this uh, project here. Uh, it's narrow vein, so in, in terms of the amount of money you spend to get a reserve life in front of you, you know, we'll, we'll probably work toward a 10-year mine life. Uh, but, you know, just to give you an example, I used to work for Dome Mines in Timmins, Canada. And Dome Mines ran for 120 years, and they kept basically two years of reserves in front of them for those 120 years because of the cost that it uh, it is incurred in order. It's not like you know drilling 50,000, 50 million tons in uh, in Nevada. Uh, you practically have to spend about 80 percent of your mining costs to bring that into a reserve. So we would replace our reserves as we go every year. Okay, um, Angelus. On a recent show, you spoke very positively about Orkana. Why do you rate Orkana? And do you have a question for Kevin? Yes, uh, first of all, I have to disclose that we have been shareholders in Arcana for several years now, and we have stayed uh, with the company, helping the management and, and participating in the financing uh, along the way, uh, believing in the embedded value of the resource and the ultimate uh, delivery of that value once uh, the resource could be brought into production. And, and we have started seeing this uh, happen over the last uh, six to eight months. Uh, we think that the, the team is very professional, it's very confident, they, they have been able to take the necessary steps to secure the financing to build this uh, project and, and uh, bring it to production. But most importantly, we are uh, also great believers uh, in the silver price. We think, uh, like as Kevin uh, indicated earlier, that uh, silver is in the early stages of a great bull market and not only because of the industrial uses, but also because uh, it is um, a, a, a similarly considered to gold as a safe haven and, and store of value. And it has started to catch on uh, in investors' imagination in the last uh, six or uh, seven months, uh, particularly as uh, gold uh, breached uh, the $2,000 an ounce level. Now, uh, we think, I, I want to congratulate uh, first uh, the team for achieving this uh, debt financing to uh, progress the project to production. Uh, there's a lot of work ahead of them. Um, and the question is, uh, what happens now to the Shafter project? Uh, obviously you have your hands uh, full in bringing the Revenue Virginia's uh, project to production. It's going to be a very hectic uh, six to 12 months. Do you pay much attention to the Shafter project? Because we believe that this is another block of value in the company that is currently not recognized properly by the market. And as Kevin indicated, it is fully permitted. It has an old PEA that perhaps needs to be refreshed. But uh, in the light of higher commodity prices, the a refreshed PEA is likely to be much more attractive economically than before. Uh, so, how much time can the, te can the team uh, dedicate to this uh, second sort of crown jewel, if you like? Well, and needless to say, Angelo, uh, you know, our focus is on the Revenue Virginia's uh, mine. We, we need to get it into production and I need all my people focused on that. I don't want distractions at this stage of the game. We need to execute our spend rate because we have a sh such a short timeline to production of, you know, we're, we're looking at six months. You know, basically to spend $30 million uh, to get it, that first ore through the mill. So we have to be focused. We have to be, uh, we have to execute and we have to execute well. And we've had a lot of time to plan. So that's going to be our focus for the next six months. Uh, there's no doubt about that. We're not going to be focusing and distracting ourselves right now with the, uh, with the Shafter project. We will, as soon as reasonably 
uh, you know, possible. We will uh, take some of our technical people and we will start to look at the, uh, you know, what we need to do at Chapter to get it into production. But first and foremost, we need to do a drill program there. We need a, an infill program uh, to, uh, to just get a better reliable resource there and, and get a mine plan to it. You know, one of the things we have been exploring and we've been approached by, we've not done anything with it, is a, is a joint venture where, uh, you know, there's others out there, of course, as the silver price goes up, uh, you know, this becomes more valuable and there's more interest generated. But there are uh, those out there that are, you know, want to talk to us about doing a joint venture where they would spend the money and earn in a bit on this thing and, and do some of that work that we need to do. But barring all any of that that might happen in the future, you know, we're looking at 18 months to two years before we would see the the uh, drilling and uh, the feasibility complete uh, and be ready to put uh, Shafter into production. Shafter is not a lot of money, 25, 20 to 25 million bucks uh, from what we can see right now. Uh, but it, uh, you know, it will be a mine in the future, but just don't want to get distracted uh, in the near term. Just bringing in Jonathan into the conversation, what are your thoughts on silver stocks in general, Jonathan? And do you have a question for Kevin? Yeah, I mean, look, we, we view silver as, as really gold on steroids, so it'll outperform in an up cycle and, and probably underperform in a down cycle. At, at the beginning of the year, we saw the silver gold ratio blowing out to 120 times. Uh, it's back at around 80 times the five year trailing average, but you know, always bear in mind that the 20 year trailing average here is 60 times, so, so there could be more to go here. And as we saw in 2011 12, when silver moves, it moves very aggressively because it doesn't have the deep liquidity that gold does, and so, so it's, it's easier to move that market. Um, it's also much more of an industrial metal and, and, and more of a, a, a green metal in many ways. And so if we do see a global economic recovery, um, we would expect silver to benefit from that and to be both uh, supported and, and, and driven on, on by that. Um, in, terms of, in terms of Volcana, I mean, I guess it looks like a, a pretty straightforward um, high grade resource in a, uh, in a low political risk jurisdiction and, and, and a rather straightforward brownfield um, restart. So really, I, I guess the question I'd have would be uh, what state is the surface and underground infrastructure in? Um, can you work through the winter? And um, just, just looking at the presentation, I saw up in the northwest area, there was quite a lot of inferred material. How easy will it be to bring that into, in, into reserves and, and extend out the mine life? Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. Uh, yeah, in terms of the, uh, you know, where we are on the ground, uh, the mill is built. It's actually located underground. Uh, we're up at about 10,600 feet is where the portal goes in. And it is avalanche country. It is the San Juan Mountains and so on. Um, the reason the mill was built underground is because the original one that was there was taken out by an avalanche in the, uh, in the early part of the 20th century. Um, and uh, when these new owners came in, they, they put the mill underground, which is a great move. Uh, right now, we have uh, all of the infrastructure in place. Uh, the access, there's an 8,000 foot um, uh, tunnel that goes in to access the ore body. It's already in. Uh, we've already started uh, two raises going up 850 feet to access that upper area where the highest grade is. Uh, up in the indicated zone, uh, and the grades up there run 55 to 60 ounces per ton. Uh, so we're targeting those to bring them online. So we're well on our way. Uh, we're, we're laying foundations right now for some of the surface infrastructure we need. The uh, winter tailings is built. We had to put a bridge in. That's done. Our passive water treatment system was a million dollar. Uh, we've just completed that. We're putting in uh, extensions to our dry reagent building, building in for staging materials going into the mine. And as I said, we've got 70 people working right now, and most of them are all underground. Uh, and exactly what we're doing, we need to put a hoist in to get up to those upper areas. So number one raise will be a hoist with ventilation, water, power, and uh, air. And numbers two and three raises, one will be waste, one will be ore. So all of these are being driven as we speak right now. All of our long lead items are uh, are on order. Uh, we we made that decision in the uh, in the summer, uh, and we expect it all to be here uh, before the end of this year in times for installation into the uh, into the mill. And we're upgrading the mill a little bit. The mill is designed at 500 tons a day. We're starting up, and all of our feasibility is based on 270 uh, a day. So we've got some pretty good organic upside that we can uh, we can bring 
additional uh, uh, production online. As soon as we establish ourselves that we've got, you know, productivities, metallurgy, cost profiles done, then we'll start bringing up that 270 closer to 400. Uh, from an operating per year basis, the road access is about a three mile, three and a half mile from Ure up to the mine site. It is a mountain road, it's a county road. Uh, we control it in the winter time, we, we maintain it. Uh, the way we built our, our uh, uh, feasibility study, we put in about, I think it was about 40 days into the operating uh, plan that we would be down and off the mountain because of snow related uh, works. We have a very uh, good, I believe, uh, avalanche control program. So, uh, you know, we're, we're anticipating that uh, there will be some time, but that's all built into the feasibility numbers. Last year, for instance, we, I don't think there was a day where we were off the mountain. The, the year before, uh, we were probably off the mountain for about two, uh, two weeks. Thank you very much for that. Um, I think it just, uh, we, now you, we now move on to our final mining update, which is from Oceana Gold. Sam Pazuki is a professional engineer with diverse experience in asset management, business development, management consulting and capital markets from over 17 years in the oil and gas mining industries. Sam joined Oceana Gold in 2012 to establish a permanent capital markets presence in North America and Europe, leading the investor relations function. Over to you, Sam. Yeah, thanks so much, Andrew. Um, I've got a few slides. I'll run through them fairly quickly just so we can get to questions. But uh, basically, Oceana Gold is an established producer. We've been in, in uh, business for 30 years plus now. We're actually celebrating our 30 year anniversary, uh, which uh, the company basically started out as a, a single asset uh, producer out of, out of New Zealand, of all jurisdictions, uh, with the McRae's mine. So that mine keeps going, and we've, we've demonstrated mine life extension from that asset. So currently we've got uh, two operations in New Zealand, one on the South Island, one on the North Island. Uh, the one on the North Island is, is called Wahi, which we purchased from Newmont back in 2015. It had a three year mine life when we purchased it. And I recall a lot of the comments from, from the analyst community was that we were basically buying an asset from Newmont to do all their re rehabilitation work, et cetera. Well, the good news is that we, we expanded that existing mine life by three years, and we've more recently put out a comprehensive uh, preliminary economic assessment, which demonstrates a much longer mine life for Wahi at a much larger production base. So it, it's a transformational um, uh, acquisition from 2015, and we're looking at both New Zealand assets going well past 2030, uh, and with, in, the, in the case of Wahi, depending on the gold price, which would impact the craze, but in the case of Wahi, we're looking at a mine life that will extend well into the 2030s. So the way to look at Oceana Gold is we're, we're circa 400,000 ounce a year uh, producer, and that excludes any production contributions from our Didipio asset. Uh, so we'll, we'll be range bound over the next uh, few years around that 400,000 ounces of gold. Uh, and, uh, and then we start uh, seeing some of these projects that we're working on uh, kick in and you'll see production moving above 500, uh, getting up to 600, 650, and quite possibly 700 with some additional enhancements we could make to the Wahi operation. Uh, so that's all organic growth and it's, it's represented through the, um, again, through number of projects that we have in our pipeline. Uh, we do believe we've got the best organic uh, growth pipeline in the industry. Um, in, in South Carolina, our U.S. asset at, at Hale, um, we will be looking to start development of an underground mine that would complement the open pit productions. Uh, and then that would make Hale a 250,000 ounce a year producer once we're combining both underground and open pit feed through the mill. And the future of the Hale operation is underground. We've got a significant number of exploration targets in the underground. And our intention is once we get underground, then we'll do some extensive drilling at depth across a, multi, a pretty extensive corridor of a couple of kilometers. At Wahi, we're building the Martha underground as we speak. It will go into production in the second quarter of next year. Uh, it will ramp up to about 90 to 100,000 ounces a year. And there's still plenty of upside with Martha Underground. Uh, the PEA utilized only half the resource that we currently have there. Uh, so we will look to add the rest of it into the mine plan, but we also are looking at uh, doubling the, uh, the resource there at Martha Underground. 
Uh, WKP is, we, we describe it as a game-changing discovery. Uh, it's a it's an area that's never been mined before, um, and it's, it's highly mineralized. Uh, we've only drilled 35,000 meters of WKP and have a resource of 1.1 million ounces uh, at high grade, so average grade of around 13 grams. And, um, and we're looking to uh, continue to drill there, but we do believe that WKP will be a multi-million ounce discovery. Uh, to put it into context, why he has produced nine million ounces of gold dating back to the 1800s. Um, there's been, an, there, there's another two, three million ounces at Martha Underground. And then WKP has similar signature to Martha Underground, but we don't quite know how big that is yet. So we're gonna continue to drill that and hopefully it'll, it'll be um, as big as Martha or as big as Wahi. And then McRae's, it's the asset that keeps on going. Uh, we just announced the new underground at Golden Point, which we'll start building soon. And we've extended the mine life at McRae's uh, out to at least 2028. Uh, so pretty good outcome for, for the asset there, which will generate a lot of free cash flow for us going forward. And then finally, on the, on the last slide here that I have, so again, we're, we're focused on delivering long-term value to shareholders. Uh, we are in top tier jurisdictions in the US and, and New Zealand. Uh, we're pretty much the only um, miner in uh, gold miner in New Zealand, and we've got most of the, the good ground there in, in that country. Uh, so we'll be building three underground mines uh, over the next uh, few years. We're expanding three open pits, and we'll continue to explore that world-class discovery at WKP. Thank you very much for that. Jonathan, what are your thoughts on Oceana Gold, and do you have a question for Sam? Yeah, I mean, look, Oceana has you know, been around a long time, and it's 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 very well regarded as a as a high quality operator. And I think certainly, you know, a few years ago, when people are thinking about processing technology, what Oceana was doing at um, McRae's with Pox was was always seen as as absolutely world class. Um, I, I mean, I, I guess it's perhaps a harder question to ask, but you know, what do you see as the route through at the Dipio as things stand? And uh, just looking around Hale. Um, and, and seeing that you're moving underground with Horseshoe, what, what's the what's the broader exploration pr potential at Hale, and it, what has happens at Horseshoe at depth? There are other other ore bodies there that you can exploit from underground. You know, thanks for the question, Jonathan. Uh, I thought I'd get away from having to answer any questions related to the Philippines, but um, you know, I'll adjust that fairly quickly. Sure. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, we're, we've got the Dipio operation, which is truly world class operation. It's it, it generates some very good cash flows. Uh, and more importantly, I think it has one of the best workforces that I've ever seen, uh, whether it's in oil and gas or uh, in, in mining. Um, if I can clone this workforce, I would. I'd put them in every operation that we have. I'd, I'd put them in into any development projects that we have. They are truly world class and, um, and we're, we'll continue to support them as we go through um, the, the ongoing negotiations with the government on the renewal of our contract. So the national government remains supportive of the renewal, uh, but we have yet to see the, the actual document uh, be renewed by the president. So we'll continue to engage with the national government on that front. And as I mentioned, work with the local stakeholders as well, including our workforce. Uh, but we have been shut down there for about a year. So it's, it's something we'll continue to focus on and it's a priority for us to restart the operations. And um, with Hale, it's, um, you know, it's been a bit of a challenge for us uh, since we, um, we started commissioning Hale back in 2017. Uh, it is still, we do see it as a, a new mine uh, that we've, we've been working out uh, some of the teething challenges of having a new mine. Uh, initially, it was related to processing. I think we've solved the puzzle re related to processing. Uh, and now we're dealing with, uh, with, with the mining. Um, and the biggest problems we've had with mining is, is predominantly what's happening externally. And whether you climate, call it climate change or something else, uh, we continue to see record rainfall in the, in the Carolinas. Uh, we had a very challenging Q4 2018, uh, which, which brought a lot of rain following a few hurricanes. Um, we've overcome a lot of those challenges and we, we've learned a lot in terms of mining in such conditions. Um, but even despite that, we, we've seen 51 inches of rainfall so far this year, which is the highest amount of rainfall they've seen in the Carolinas in the last 35 years. Uh, so that's something we're going to have to continue to manage from a risk perspective. Uh, but the future, as I mentioned, is underground, is, is uh, going to 
to build the underground with, with Horseshoe being the first deposit. Um, it, it is high grade. It doesn't have to, uh, we don't have to worry about weather once, once you go underground. Uh, there are extensions to Horseshoe that we can see through the drilling that we've done. Uh, so we're very excited to actually build the underground, get underground, start drilling Horseshoe more extensively in panels two. And another potential area, which would be a panel three, which we've dug horseshoe deeps. And then as we go over to the uh, to the west in the underground, we've got several other targets. Uh, the only other one that we, we have a resource on, which is uh, entirely an inferred resource, is called Palomino. Uh, but in that corridor between horseshoe and Palomino, uh, we've got a target called snake shoe, uh, which is underneath the snake pit. So they're not, the, the operation is not very good at marketing, but um, that they're very good at discovering gold. And so we see there's definitely some smoke there at Snake Shoe. Uh, as we go west, there's another target, which we just announced that we'll, we'll be drilling called Pisces. And then beyond, beyond Palomino, there's, uh, there's another target called um, Aquarius, which we'll, be, uh, which we'll be looking to drill. So the future of Hale is underground. Uh, we're, we'd even look to optimize the open pits by lifting the pit floor and targeting some of the, the at-depth mineralization through an underground. Um, back to your presentation. In your presentation, you talked about your organic growth. Within this organic growth, would you consider m and transactions? Yeah, it'd be very difficult for us to, to, to look at uh, doing anything externally at this stage. I mean, we're, we are in favor of consolidation in the industry. We've welcomed some of the deals that we've seen. I mean, Endeavor's deal with Semifo made a lot of sense. Um, the, the recent transaction with Nordenstar and Saracen makes a lot of sense. There, there's some, a lot of synergies there between those two organizations. Uh, we, we would consider those opportunities for ourselves, looking at uh, a merger of equals with, with a like-minded company. Uh, where there are synergies, where there is, uh, you know, a good marriage there. Uh, for us to go look for acquisitions, to, to actively uh, pursue them, is probably not in the cards, just given how robust our organic growth uh, pipeline is. So for us, especially with the higher gold price, we'll look internally. Again, we've got, we believe, to be the best organic growth projects uh, in the industry. Uh, we'll, we'll continue to advance them forward. We'll continue to invest in them. And I think we can create a lot of shareholder value by continuing to, to invest extensively in exploration. Uh, that's, in our opinion, in my opinion anyways, it's, it's a great way to create shareholder value is through the drill bit. Mm -hmm. And just uh, bringing Martina into the conversation, do you as Endeavor have any more M&A plans? Would you ever, for example, look at expanding um, beyond West Africa? I think it's interesting that you know the higher gold price environment has has sparked more M and A in the space. Uh, for us, it's been part of our you know turnaround story for the last four years. Uh, we've divested three assets, uh, which were short mine life or high cost, uh, and in turn uh, we bought uh, Kalana, which uh, was a development stage project and, and at the time the only project in our pipeline. Uh, we bought Karma uh, and most recently Semifo. So we've built a strong West African platform where we're starting to see good synergies and being able to slot assets uh, into this uh, West African platform. Uh, going forward, I mean, the strategy doesn't change. It's about getting you know, assets that uh, can continue to improve the quality of our portfolio while leveraging the expertise in West Africa. Uh, mm -hmm. That being said, uh, when you take a look at the deals that were done, uh, they've all been at, uh, at low premiums and, and for quality assets. Uh, in West Africa, the space is, uh, you know, there's not that many assets left that are not within uh, larger, you know, larger companies. Uh, and there's a lack of, you know, good assets available. So uh, I think that the higher gold price environment has meant that assets that would have been for sale previously are, are no longer for sale. Uh, and companies that might have at some point needed a larger partner such as ourselves uh, to either fund or you know, uh, be able to, to leverage this larger platform we have are no longer sellers. Uh, so it makes uh, the, uh, uh, in any case in West Africa, the competitive space on MEA much more competitive. Uh, so for us, it's more a question now of you know, not, not needing to do MA, 
Uh, obviously, you know, it remains part of everybody's job to continue to screen opportunities because you don't want to miss something. But we have the luxury of having a good portfolio with four projects in the pipeline. Uh, so we're not under any pressure to need to continue to consolidate. Okay. And I think we've just got time for one last question from Angela. Do you have a question for uh, Sam? Well, uh, Sam has already answered the questions I had in relation to the Philippines and uh, the hail operation in South Carolina. The only residual uh, question I had in relation to South Carolina is that it obviously is one of the worst affected uh, US states from COVID. Um, and, and I'm wondering uh, how do they see the situation develop there and what are the you know, safety precautions that the company takes or uh, what, what sort of downtime they expect to have because of the infection rates? You know, thanks, Angelos. Yeah, it's, it's, as I mentioned, it's a risk that we've been managing since uh, the beginning of March um, when the pandemic really hit the, uh, hit the, hit the world. Um, we've got some very strict protocols that we implemented in early March, which we, we, we currently have still. Um, we, uh, only essential workers are permitted onto, uh, onto site, whether it's contractors or, or operating personnel. Uh, every single person coming into the site has to be screened. There's a health screening at the gate. Uh, there's temp temperature checks as well, too. Uh, our protocols uh, mandate that any worker that has uh, any symptoms whatsoever needs to quarantine, um, get tested and quarantine for a period of two weeks. Anyone who's come into contact with anyone who's had symptoms or is tested positive uh, also have to quarantine for two weeks. Um, so these are fairly strict protocols that we have in place. And since the beginning of March, we've had almost 300 people who have had to sit off for a period of two weeks uh, we, we went from having no cases up until June, where we had um, our first case. And then once the, uh, I guess right after the Independence Day weekend, uh, we started to see an increase in the number, number of positive cases. Um, so we had uh, eight, I guess, by the end of July, and we had 18 by the end of August. And I believe we've got 20 now since the start of March. So I mentioned before, I mean, we're, we're operating in an area uh, in a part of the world where they're not behaving as if there was a global pandemic. Uh, but with our protocols, with the safeguards that we do have in place, which includes uh, the screening process that I mentioned, uh, as well as contact tracing, we've, been, we've managed to uh, ensure that there's no COVID outbreak at the site. Um, so the, the result, if there is a COVID outbreak at the site, what that means is that the regulator would have to shut us down for four weeks, uh, which is what's happened to uh, some of the industries that that have had COVID outbreaks um, in South Carolina. So we'll, we'll continue to work hard to avoid that from happening. Uh, we'd rather operate with 50% capacity um, than 0% capacity for a four week period. Okay, many, many thanks for that, Sam. And we are out of time. So once again, many thanks to our guests. Many thanks to you, the audience, for tuning in. Many thanks to our sponsors, Oceana Gold or Canada Resources and Endeavor Mining. And many thanks to Resource Global Network, our partners for this event. We will go and see you next time at the Thursday next week. Until then, stay safe. Thank you very much. <laughs>